Maitreya Buddha or, or Tushta or think that people can receive um, in a vision, then um, I ask you to uh, phenomenologically bracket that judgment and um, suspend uh, disbelief, just like you would in a play or a movie, all right, like that, um, and to uh, consider it from that point of view, that um, this is something that um, isn't entirely uh, constructed or, um, you know, by a conventional <laughs> Uh, religious person, but I um, was actually transmitted. Um, this is kind of the approach that uh, Robert Thurman uh, took in our first text we looked at. And uh, as people know who've met him or studied with him, he's uh, enthusiastic and evangelical and religious and secular all at once. <clears throat> and, uh, you know, from the standpoint of the scholarship, I you know, appreciate that approach. <clears throat> uh, but uh, that's not the end of uh, the methodology. Uh, we have to examine also who is it that's reading and uh, with what kind of self or what kind of identity are we actually reading and studying and even listening tonight. When uh, Westerners uh, come to Buddha Dharma, um, uh, generally we have uh, a high level of education, at least from you know our point of view. Many people that are attracted to it, uh, you know, have uh, at least a bachelor's degree and advanced degrees in education and competences like that. So you know we have learned a lot. We have a good intellect, <clears throat> and when we uh, read and uh, hear about doctrines of uh, interdependence in Shunita or nature of mind, um, we tend to think that, okay, the mind and the personality or the self is uh, that we're talking about, either affirming or negating, is the one that we're having right now in 21st century America. But uh, I'd like to question this. Uh, that uh, this is um, uh, a dangerous or suspect uh, cultural appropriation. Uh, for people that have traveled and lived in other cultures, uh, not everybody thinks like um, 21st century Californians <laughs> or Europeans. Um, the sense of community and the sense of personal self uh, and the sense of the divine can be quite different. Uh, it's particularly different um, in societies that uh, I would say uh, are pre-scientific or have been pre-scientific and still uh, have a strong uh, mythological, uh, mythopoetic uh, framework, if you will. And one of those cultures is the Tibetan culture. Even though the Tibetans um, course, we're introduced to uh, cars and radios by the British, and maybe even lived before that around the turn of the century, and have had a hundred years of acquaintance with um, modern thought. Uh, in general, the worldview, um, when we're talking from a Dharma point of view, is uh, pre-scientific and uh, pre um, pre-psychological, like that. Um, and uh, even though lamas in India or Tibet or even here uh, may be using uh, mobile phones and be quite tech savvy, uh, from their standpoint, we may uh, make a mistake that they're thinking from the same kind of uh, human rights, individual renaissance, reformation, scientific materialism, uh, kind of uh, social self that um, uh, many of us uh, ascribe to. <clears throat> so when we talk about uh, emptiness, for example, emptiness of no self, 
Uh, many times in the West, we're thinking, well, there's my kind of self, which has all these ideas about things, and that's interdependent, and that's empty. And then I've uh, then at least seen the emptiness of personal self, or that's true personal self. Uh, but uh, many times so people have spent time in other cultures and spent time around Tibetans. That doesn't necessarily mean that then you're talking from the same sense of self at all. So I would like to suggest that um, we have to deconstruct and examine our background and the sense of who we are and how we've come to form a sense of identity in the West on a deeper level than just saying, okay, it's arisen interdependently, that uh, the modern fabrication of the self is uh, uh, much more complex in many ways than um, a pre-modern self. Not to say the pre-modern self isn't complex, but it's complex in different ways. So that um, we have to, uh, in a way, become also students of history or of anthropology or sociology and uh, think about what it would be like to live in a pre-modern society. These texts were written and Dharma was uh, born, so to speak, in a very agricultural pre-modern society where the sense of personal self and the sense of community was very much different. So when we start in, you know, we use terms like, well, my Buddha nature and my qualities or, uh, we're just talking about the qualities in translation here that we see in, in the text. Uh, they have associations that uh, I think are very different. Uh, you know, primarily in the West, we see ourselves as individuals first and social beings second. Uh, but uh, the text and the culture uh, coming out from a different point of view radically different point of view that uh, one's community and family uh, are the basis and the individual tends to be secondary. I'm happy to have a, um, an intelligent debate about this, but uh, and I won't insist on right, but uh, uh, the sense of self that uh, we're looking for in Buddha Dharma does not feel like an enlightened um, modern individual self. Uh, the self uh, that I've been trained under uh, is uh, that uh, with mainly Tibetans, but also Japanese masters, uh, is a really different sense of empty personal self. So it's not just a matter of saying, well, my self now is empty or I'm just going to be my regular personal self, but less selfish. Actually, there's a really different sense of being in the world um, when one, uh, you know, studies Dharma and studies these texts and even bringing a sense of openness and to that will help us understand the text better. When I'm talking about developing a, a really a different sense of self. I'm not saying then we culturally become Tibetan or Japanese or Asian or French or anything. Um, we're still going to be culturally conditioned. But uh, the way uh, we imagine the self emerges is, is going to be different than uh, an individualistic point of view. <clears throat> we're going to have our own kind of uh, uh, tribal sense of uh, cohesion and tribal sense of uh, personal self. And uh, that's uh, what I'd like to call Sangha. I don't know the closest word for it except tribal. <clears throat> uh, the Sangha that um, arose in uh, India, uh, which included uh, uh, householder men and women and of course yogis still had a very communal 
and um, tribal kind of view. It, uh, it wasn't just that the monasteries or the retreat centers were um, communally oriented. I mean, the whole community was very different. <clears throat> uh, maybe the closest thing in America would be Native American uh, groups, but um, in my experience, the closest uh, would be monastery, but on a householder, the close, closest would be living in a small town. Okay, so living in a small town, like maybe um, grew up in a small town in New York, and then let's say Nevada City, just up the road. Uh, it means that like everybody knows your business. Now, a lot of times we we think, well, I I want some people to know my business, but other people I don't want them to know my business because it's none of their business, right? But what if you were actually in a society, in a community where everyone knew your business back about five generations? Well, that's called a small town in Vermont called Middlebury. <laughs> but uh, honestly, that is how the uh, Dharma, as we know, it grew up and, and the context in which these texts were uh, written and studied that imagine your sense of self, your sense of identity, if everybody really knows your business, where you come from, who your parents were, who your grandparents were, maybe great grandparents, and everybody knew exactly what you should be doing all the time. Well, that's monastery life, but that's also very, very close to close community life. Everybody sees who you are, you don't have to have a strong psychological self. Um, you don't have to be asking people all the time, what are you thinking? What are you feeling? Or expressing, what are you thinking? What are you feeling? Because people can just see it on your face. Or generally in modern society, we're going to have a number of different masks, professional masks or family masks or social masks, uh, personas, if you will, that um, are going to hide what we're really feeling. But just imagine if you lived in a community where actually everyone kind of knew all the particulars about you. They knew when you got up in the morning. They knew who your kids were or not kids, or they knew when you were making love. You knew everything about you. They knew when you went to the outhouse. And you didn't really have to tell anybody exactly what you're feeling. It just showed. Does that sound like a kind of community you would like to live in? If it is, nod your head like this. <laughs> well, uh, that's the experience of emptiness and being open as like everyone knows just what's up because uh, you're just showing it. <clears throat> so uh, when we're talking about uh, emptiness of self or uh, nature of mind, clarity, uh, uh, luminosity, if you will, uh, energy and power, spaciousness and no self, that means like total and utter transparency. Like people don't have to guess what you're thinking or feeling because it's just right there. There's no, absolutely no uh, mask at all. I must admit, it's not always easy living that way. Uh, I'm not claiming that I'm always living that way but I, I really know that experience and what it's like to live in that kind of way where um, you don't have to think psychologically because you automatically know what's going on with everybody and what's going on with nature and animals and people because it's just on their face and their actions. So I'd like to suggest that the texts we're reading have to be read and appreciated from a communal sense of self where we have a deep identity and we know who we are, but the identity is formed in dependence uh, on the tribal fact, the herd animal fact of what human beings are. Then when we're talking about Buddha qualities, and then it, it kind of makes sense because of course, Buddha qualities, uh, the qualities of Buddha nature are things, uh, I could say things, qualities that we are 
but not qualities that we own. They're qualities that we are, but not qualities that we own. It's kind of depressing sometimes to think like we go to all this work to be uh, bodhisattvas or Buddhas, and we don't own it, you know? <laughs> you can't copyright it. You can't uh, say, well, this is my accomplishment, and now I'm this, right? <clears throat> We accomplish it for the whole community and we accomplish it for ourselves, but basically we're accomplishing it for the whole community first. So that's why I like to call the goal of the uh, practice is interdependent independence. So I'd like to uh, pause here because I've been talking now for 20 minutes and um, uh, take comments and criticisms and complaints, um, you know, before we, uh, or I move forward. Is that all right? <clears throat> well, I see very many smiling faces and I appreciate that. Um, I would like to say that, uh, it's okay. Um, you don't always have to, uh, from my side, uh, uh, always uh, show your face on the video. Um, it's more about you you maintaining a sense of uh, openness from your side um, so that uh, when you look in the mirror, you're able to recognize yourself. Um, so uh, I'm just as happy in a way, um, you know, uh, looking at Dirk's cat as looking at um, Dirk's face. Um, uh, but uh, there you just switched it. Thank you. Because uh, I know he's very interdependent with his cat, you know? Isn't that right? <laughs> so uh, I, I am, Lama, but, but I've had my video on the whole time. I think I'm having, there's a connection problem. Are you having a hard time hearing or a hard time talking? I was having, well, I, there's a little bit of connection and I had to disconnect and reconnect. And I think I've had my video on the whole time, but my uh, video hasn't been showing the whole time. <laughs> do, you, do you want me to say everything all over again? No, I think I think I got the gist. Okay. <laughs> okay. And I, and I uh, it's something, you know, it's something that I've thought about a lot because I grew up not not in any place or among any group of people. I'd never had a tribe as a child, and in that sense. And uh, so, but uh, but I was wondering about how it, uh, you know, b when Buddha left his family and his uh, his possessions and went off by himself. <laughs> That seems like he that that shows how what a radical move that was, a much yeah. more radical move than it would be in our society. Even though it it had an accepted role in society, um, I I think yes, it was very radical, particularly you know someone in his position. But um, even then, it was it was. Kind of like, well, I'm I'm off to be homeless and living in the streets, <laughs> you know. And if somebody announced that that was their great goal, like, oh, you were accepted to Stanford, that's really nice. And then you go, well, actually, I've decided to become homeless and in the streets, you know, and, and meditate. And we go, what, you know, like that, yeah. The um, the tribal part by itself. Uh, uh, doesn't guarantee things, but it's there, how how the teachings uh, arisen, um, so that uh, there are many people that have had uh, different upbringings and very solo, but somehow they've been able to um, maintain a, a sense of transparency and uh, a sense of interconnection without uh, you know uh, becoming uh, very solo and alone in a hardened way. So uh, I think it's easier when we're we're in a group of people and we have uh, an interdependent identity, but uh, doesn't mean like we all have to be in a commune or sleep in the same room and 
uh, it is the natural state of human beings. So uh, uh, I have met people that have been wanderers uh, from place to place um, as children too, and you know have developed a strong sense of interdependence, right? Because uh, they haven't reified where they've lived like that. <clears throat> um, that two um, teachers that we've explored in retreat, Pacharimshe and Shabkar, um, uh, spent most of their time uh, wandering. And um, my root teacher, Geshe Yatsu, uh, after he came to America, um, uh, didn't have a fixed uh, uh, situation, didn't uh, make a big temple or dharma center, but uh, liked to travel around and spend time in people's houses like that. It was frustrating because I wanted a big center, of course. <laughs> so uh, I want to hear if anybody else uh, feels uh, they resonate with what I'm talking about or would like to uh, debate a little bit. I don't know. Lama, it's Ellen. I, I had a comment. I don't really have a question or I definitely don't want to debate you. But um, when you were talking about the historical differences that what came up for me is this whole concept of property rights that seemed to develop in this country in particular. And, and it even um, then struck me the difference that I experienced when I moved when I was about 10 from Iowa to California. In my neighborhood in Iowa, we didn't have fences. You know, your backyard uh. backed up to your neighbor's backyard and your neighbor's side yards, and you just kind of all hung out together. In California, I came and then we had these big wooden fences and it seems so separate, you know, so this trend that we had in, in this, I guess, industrial era or maybe before where we started having property rights and all, it seems to really have done a disservice in sort of shifting us all to that thought that we're separate and we need to protect our own property and family. And so I guess we just have a little bit extra job to do now to kind of not apply that to our individualism entirely or something. I don't know. I wondered what your thoughts were. To overcoming that, uh, compensating. I, I think we do. I think we do have a, an extra job. Yes. Um, uh, at this point in the world, I mean, I I don't want to like make up the myth of, you know, Rousseau's natural human being or go searching for, um, you know, the the hidden valley where people are not corrupted by civilization or modern life. I don't know if we could find that anymore anywhere on the planet, but uh, you know, since the, we have to understand that the personal self uh, is formed interdependently, so if we're not really taking that out into the environment and society and analyzing that, we're we're missing the point of interdependence. So we like to think we own our personal self even after we think it's maybe empty of essence, right? But I'm pointing out that actually uh, we, we don't really even own our personal self the way we normally think we do. So uh, the fences actually don't work. <laughs> they work for cows maybe, yeah. Like that. Thank you. This, uh, you know, because uh, you know, questions have come up uh, like, okay, if if we are all these Buddha qualities, uh, as the Shastra tones, like um, people in the West can ask questions like, well, if we are all those and we don't have uh, everything referenced back to a personal self, then how do we get by in the world, right? So um, from a classical um, pre-modern point of view, that's weird to you know have that question because the reason we don't get by in the world is everything's fenced and in. Uh, so it's saying like if everyone were free, wouldn't there be this horrible anarchy uh, in a negative way, and uh, we wouldn't be able to function without a sense of ownership? But uh, 
in, in our tradition, we renounce ownership, but maintain uh, a sense of transformed identity. So instead of putting our primary identity on a, a constructed personal self, and on top of that, even a misperceived self, uh, our identity is on the commons self, which is, is Buddha nature. So uh, when I'm talking like this, uh, uh, I know I know some people haven't um, even started reading the uh, the text, um, but uh, I have to, for my own sanity, <laughs> I have to talk from the, the standpoint of you've read the text, <laughs> uh, so that. Um, you know, I, I go into the depth that I feel we need to do like that. So um, the way to uh, study in the program uh, is to read a text like this uh, uh, with with a sense of flow, just like even the uh, Madhyamakan texts or the tenets, so that um, you're just listening to the music, so to speak. And then you go back actually a second time and that's when you're going to read it more analytically, like what does that mean and where does that come from and what are the salient points. Otherwise, uh, you won't really hear the immediacy of basically what's, what's a long poem, right? You're basically reading like, you know, uh, the Odyssey, or you're reading Paradise Regained in this sense, right? Uh, so you, you have to read it in a very flowing way, uh, which is why a couple of weeks ago I suggested, why don't you put on some good music? So you just read along with the music. It can't be read from the standard um, way that we went to college or grad school or high school. It's not taught that way. It wasn't written that way. And um, I'm afraid that, you know, many of the uh, wonderful universities that have Buddhist study programs and even uh, some of the online programs from uh, Naropa and Maitripa and FPMT and Jamyang still to fit into the Western mold are having people read things as if they're in a Western university. And uh, I think it would be the same as, um, uh, you know, like one of uh, one of my favorite movies, uh, Dead Poets Society, where um, Robin Williams is trying to get the class to actually feel the impact of the poetry um, and not just analyze it into whether it's a good poem or not, uh, that you actually feel the impact of the poem. So. Uh, that's why I'm suggesting that uh, you first read these texts as as a long inspired poem and then go back and read them analytically. It doesn't really take that much time if you read through it like you're listening to a song or a poem. And I, I'm wondering if anybody here has, has done it that way. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, I mean... It's different, isn't it? You know, it has a different quality. Uh, <clears throat> you can read you it out check... loud in about two hours. Yes, exactly. Yes. And uh, I know you've talked about doing that. So that's cool. Um, yes, uh, Dirk brings up a good point that uh, our tradition, even though we have lots of written material, is primarily an oral tradition. Uh, definitely in the tantras, uh, even even the lower tantras, but particularly uh, in the higher tantras, uh, without uh, another being reading it out to you so you actually hear it, you haven't received the empowerment of the transmission. You actually have to like hear it. Now, of course, we we have 
empowerments and initiations done uh, through video, but you're still hearing something in real time, right? So uh, you're, you're hearing the flow, you're hearing the music. Music wouldn't be very fun if, uh, you know, you, you, you couldn't hear the whole symphony or the whole opera, you just had to start picking it apart, right? Anybody take a music appreciation class and, you know, <laughs> Well, it, it, was, it could have been ruined for you, Eleanor. They just said, well, we're just going to listen to the five opening bars of Schubert's Unfinished Symphony and spend the whole month in that. And you've never listened to the whole thing, right? Did, don't, didn't you want to listen to the whole thing? And then, I don't know, how did, how did your course go? So, go ahead. So. Ellen, Ellen's on, but she's not talking. But. Yeah, no, I wasn't sure if you were talking to me. No, mine was more like putting the notes together to make the chords and the thirds and the fifths. And you're right, it was very mathematical. And <clears throat> I mean, I learned some things about the constitution of music, but I'm glad that's not my only introduction to music. I'm glad I sang in the mm -hmm. choir for a few years before I ever did that. Mm -hmm. So you got the idea that actually, you know, the real world, our lived experience is uh, flow and rhythm and continuity, just like it said in the text. This is the continuity of good nature, the continuity of uh, awareness and enlightened mind. And then once we got the fact that it's continuity and feel it in our body, in our bones, uh, then, then we can begin to uh, you know, analyze it like that. So, uh, you know, you actually can, as uh, Dirk said, read it through uh, in a couple of hours and um, maybe play music aside. I don't know what works for you, but uh, maybe Dirk had suggested actually um, spending a time so you would read it aloud. Is that right? Uh, yeah, I thought we would we could do a group reading where each of us takes a section of the poem. <laughs> Yes. And read it together. Uh, yes. I'll su I'll have to suggest a day. I can't commit to a day right now. Yeah, but I, that's uh, very traditional where people uh, would do rounds of recitation uh, like that. Um, so it isn't just rounds of uh, uh, mantras, but doing rounds of recitation. So that's very traditional. Um, uh, it isn't uh, just that way in the Tibetan tradition, but also in the, you know, I did that in the Zen monastery also. So we have a question on the floor here. So if you experience your qualities that you can't own, and if it's more communal, why isn't it discussed as to how these qualities interact between different people or within the community. It always seems to talk about a single person or a single being, not about beings interacting together. Right. Well, um, that's a good point. The um, Sangha and community is um, assumed as the basis when we're reading this. So um, it's assumed that you're hearing this through a living person or reading it with a living person or within a spiritual community. So uh, they assume you've already got that. Like you, you've, you've got the idea that um, uh, we're, we're, we're speaking to everybody. So um, it's like, everybody probably should realize like gravity affects everybody. Okay. So we, we don't have to talk about gravity a lot. We can talk to, you know, how um, you have to have proper posture to uh, be in line with gravity, but we don't have to remind people that everybody um, has the same situation with gravity on the planet anyway. So likewise, uh, these texts are this assumption that 
um, they're speaking to uh, a community of people and the sense of self and the sense of no self um, uh, is related to community and Sangha from the beginning like that. More, less? We find my question. Mm -hmm. The quality of this vision nature may not arise within each individual at the same time, or at the same rate, or at the same intensity. So the interaction of those qualities within the community is important. Do you have to know what my question is? Um. It, it's it's spoken of in the like particularly here in the language of uh, all beings as the community. So um, uh, you know it's not talking about community as you know so much as we think in the West of like associations of human beings around a certain structure, but uh, because the Buddha is regarding. Uh, all beings and uh, all worlds. So the community is as these vast universes, and uh, the community is discussed in that way. So generally, in in these uh, visionary texts, the uh, you know the community isn't referenced in a historical, political, economic way. Uh, you know the way we might do in the West. The, the Pali Suttas, when the Buddha was talking to tribes and kingdoms, uh, th there is a lot of talk about actual human organizations and communities, but in these exalted, uh, so to speak, uh, Shastras and Sutras, like uh, Flower Ornament Sutra and Lotus Sutra, and even the Heart Sutra, um, you know, the, the community is these vast number of beings with a uh, vast number of Buddha fields and, and stuff like that. So they're very, uh, it's a very transcendental approach like that. So when reading these texts, we have to um, drop uh, for a while our literal kind of sense of community and go to this kind of uh, mythopoetic Sambhogakaya community like that. But in, in India now, even now in Tibet, in India, the understanding is that uh, that has direct impact on, uh, you know, actual people's lives too. So people understand the metaphor like that. Is that helpful? No. <laughs> so I mean, like, why don't these texts specifically talk about like? Take this, uh, take this text, or walk into town and talk about it, or talk to specific male, female communities. Talk about gender. Talk about economic structure like that. Yeah. No. I guess the balance between the community hopefully progresses as a whole with enlightenment. Yeah. That can't be a, an easy road. No. And as a precious human life, it's precious and rare. Right. Most beings are not currently on that path. Right. So there's not a good balance of those on that path to those not on the path, and suffering is greater than those on the path of enlightenment. Right. There's got to be a, a much more difficult, or, or the balance is not good. Of the qualities that are being expressed from past enlightenment, so there's got to be some conflict because in turmoil, there goes along with gaining these qualities and using these qualities for the community as a whole, as you've just expressed. There is a learning process that happens with that, that, that if you just look as a, a single being who has these qualities and is trying to act for a community as well, like Lion's Horn versus. A community of beings with these qualities trying to act for all beings. It seems like a different problem, a, a different situation. 
So you're talking about relative beings that are struggling. So like that, I mean, the, the Buddha qualities um, that are, you know, we're going over and over in the text uh, are like elements in our senses, like gravity. <laughs> so, um, you know, and time and things like that that we might think in physics where um, we're subject to time and gravity and in a sense we are time and gravity, um, but not everybody realizes that we're made up of time and gravity and things like that. So uh, there's, there's the community as a whole and then there's the community of people that realize that. And uh, the, uh, it, it sounds individualistic in one way, but the, the assumption is that um, these relative and absolute communities are uh, working in harmony like that. And that's one of the qualities of the higher bodhisattvas and Buddhas that they see the practical communities uh, and uh, like, like lines were and the uh, uh, you could say the community of Buddha qualities operating at the same time like that. Uh, the hard part for Westerners is the Shastra and the texts don't start from the assumption of a personal self um, and then uh, try to expand it or negate it from that point. The, it's starting from an absolute point of view and then working down. So uh, it's not working. It's not working like we have ignorant people. It's not a long rim style. It's starting from the top. Uh, but whether you kind of start from a very relative, confused point of view or you start from an absolute point of view, uh, then you still have the problem of why, uh, you know, why do some beings mature why do some people wake up and why do some people have a difficult time and uh this is one of the questions that uh the um the shastra addresses of course and that's a whole nother topic but that's that's a big one whether you whether you explain why everyone isn't enlightened or explain just originally and there's no need for dharma or why you explain how people uh became ignorant, uh, you have that uh, addressed in the Shastra. It's just not addressed in a traditional um, psychological Western way. And uh, that's frustrating to us too, because we tend to uh, want to look at uh, uh, problems and psychological issues still from a personalistic sense. Whereas uh, the Shastra and the Buddhas are looking at um, uh, from a non-personal sense, so that, that's that's why it's very hard. Uh, even though we can, it can be helped to psychologize the texts and psychologize our practices. Uh, we have to recognize that uh, that's going to be a limitation like that. Um, So uh, there was a, a author I like to read in college, um, <clears throat> uh, Greek author in translation, Nikos Kazantzakis. He wrote a lot of um, translation of the Odyssey and religious things. And he had one story, maybe it's Sufi story or Kazantzakis's, but uh, he says, I went, uh, I got up to heaven, and God says, who's there? And I, I said, me. And God said, go away. <laughs> so this happens quite a number of times until uh, this being got to meet God face to face. And God said, who's there? And uh, that person said, you are God, you see. So it's how does that flip happen from you know, that personal, uh, putting the personal self at the center to putting 
uh, the absolute at the center. You know, uh, from our standpoint, uh, we explain it uh, from both relative standpoints and absolute standpoints. And, um, in uh, kind of typical fashion, um, Maitreya and the Sangha uh, attempt to do both, right? <laughs> so, um, uh, maybe, uh, maybe we could say at times, uh, it seems baffling that um, Maitreya is uh, trying to say both things at once. What do you think? Does it sometimes feel that Shastra is like that? I think Dirk said yes. <laughs> um, that's why, uh, particularly in um, the Mahamudra and, and Dzogchen and Highest Yoga Tantra, uh, clear like mind, like the Shastra, um, the, the practice seems kind of like weird because uh, you're telling us at the same time we have those qualities completely um, matured and uh, present, and yet um, we have to do a lot of work to uncover them. But you know, if they're completely matured on their own and present, uh, how did these coverings uh, come about, and how do we remove them? Right. So these are the central questions that. Um, uh, particularly Mahayana and Tantra attempt to answer. Um, and I'm reminded by a, a quote from uh, the founder of Tassahara Suzuki Roshi, who said, uh, you're perfect just as you are, but you could use a little bit of improvement <laughs> like that. <laughs> so uh, that's the paradox. <clears throat> Uh, if we could explain exactly how, uh, this is important, <laughs> if we could explain, we being Buddhists or something, if we could explain exactly how ignorance happened and then exactly uh, how it got released in a causal way, we wouldn't be able to get free. This, of course, I'm being very... Uh, Zogchen point of view, okay? But if we, if we, if you're, you know, a lot of times we're looking for the missing link, so to speak, right? We're looking for, okay, this happened, then this happened, so this happened, you know, so, but if, if there were this deterministic causal link, if we explain exactly how ignorance happened and exactly how to get free from ignorance in the sense of a step by step causal practice, we wouldn't be able to be free. That's important that you guys get this. So uh, I'm just gonna say, you're lucky you have a llama that has some insight into this, right? Because it's it's very possible to read these texts and you know practice Mahamudra and Dzogchen, and you're still practicing it from a relative causal point of view, and you won't get it. You'll keep on looking for that missing link, right? Like somehow the the llamas are. <laughs> Rinpoche's or somebody are, are being kind of evil because they're in on some kind of joke and they just won't tell you the joke. But uh, uh, it, it doesn't work that way because uh, uh, to a large degree, our refinement uh, is causal, but actually, uh, as we even read in uh, um, Talopa's Ganges Mahamudra, it's the Dharma of the leap, right? So uh, later, perhaps when some of us are able to go on retreat and uh, we can talk about cutting through and leaping over, this might make some more sense, you know, like that. But uh, I wish it was a causal process because then we could, uh, it, it seems like it would have more um, uh, guarantees, right? You know, we just do this, do this, do this, do this. Um, but, uh, uh, you, you know, uh, we'd say from absolute standpoint, uh, even even the Buddhists can't see how it's done because you cannot objectify the nature, the ultimate nature of mind. Can't do it. 
we keep thinking we can. <laughs> we keep thinking we can objectify, uh, you know, primordial mind, uh, primordial awareness, but you can't. You you can't, you know, bring it out and just say, well, it works this way. You know, can't do that. Mama, it's Ellen. Can I make sure I heard yeah. you right? Did you yeah. say the llamas can't say how it's done or they can't see how it's done? You can't really even say how it's done. I believe that, but can they see it? You can't see it as oh. an object. Oh, sure. You see. But they can understand. You want to make it into an object. Yeah, we have to understand nature mind, but you, you can't jump outside of it and make it into an object. But, you know, because... Uh, Making objectifying things is such a useful quality in many ways from a relative standpoint, we just become completely addicted to it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so that's why we, we need to spend time uh, around the right kind of people who I, I've said before can catch us in the act of really being ourselves, right? Catch us, catch us in that blend of discipline and spontaneity, right? So to really do uh, the Buddha Dharma study program correctly, of course, I appreciate uh, the essays people have written. Uh, uh, and I will, uh, grading is secondary to me. I actually want people to, uh, you know, bring that into darshan. So I can actually, or like, talking or could be in person. So we actually talk about tenants and Madhyamka and Shastra, you know, in person too, right? Because otherwise it's too much like a college paper. You see what I'm saying? So we have to have, you have to have the meditation and the direct yogic experience combined with uh, uh, intellectual training uh, and then bring that in to meet with a living lineage person so that you have that a dynamic quality coming together. Uh, that isn't just to become, um, you know, awake, um, but actually just to do correct textual study, you see? So um, I don't know if people in college actually had that much time to spend with their professors. Um, many people went to these large universities um, I was very lucky and privileged to go to a, a small, uh, you know, liberal arts college. So I could actually track down <laughs> the professors who I was very annoying with and saying, you know, I, I don't know what you're talking about with this emptiness thing. And, and please explain this, you know. So I'd actually have like one-on-one -on -one, uh, with these scholars, you know, and some of which were practitioners at Middlebury. And uh, Chris Middlebury's uh, I'm kind of saying raw for my college, but uh, the Dalai Lama has visited Middlebury College twice. Unfortunately, when already I graduated, right? But there was a strong Buddhist studies program there, but I could actually get with the professor. So it wasn't just reading, writing a paper, turning it in, getting my grade, and, and going on to the next thing. I could sit down with Stephen Rockefeller or Victor Nuovo or the other Middlebury professors and and you know, actually sit down, which is quite a privilege. But to actually study it textually, that's what you have to do. You cannot just read it and just just write the paper. You have to have a dialogue, and uh, that that's the most important thing um, to have the dialogue with one's teacher as well as oneself. What do you think? Am I making this up? <laughs> <clears throat> difficult. So uh, when you actually have a dialogue with your teacher, uh, then then it's difficult. You have to learn how to uh, debate correctly um, without arguing. So uh, if you come up with something, you can't just assert it because I said so, right? So uh, you have to uh, work on this. This is, I say this because of that, right? So I hope eventually um, we'll be able to have some uh, preliminary uh, 
discussion and debate. Council Rinpoche is very interested in this and we've already received some assistance and we will be reading some of the uh, debate material, uh, but only after we've actually read through the basic material because you can't debate until you've read the material. Capiche, right? <laughs> so opinions don't count in debate. So we ha you have to actually debate from the material. If you have direct yogic realization, uh, that would be nice. You can also bring that in. What do you think? <laughs> I look forward to that day. So uh, if anybody else would like to join in before we say goodnight, I'd be happy to hear uh, from others like that. Okay, maybe so. Okay. Uh, hi, Lama. Um, hi. I, I was thinking about like uh, this whole this whole idea of myself as an individual. It's, it's really based on my self-image, so who who I think I am, and uh, and it's so hard to give up of your self-image, right? It, so much training in to be or to believe to be who I am, and then I have to see things from a different perspective. How how can I sacrifice that self-image without? getting completely lost. Right. So Is that's that what we're studying. Yeah, so um, we, for example, we basically, we, we actually don't need to have, uh, be, have our personal self or self-image front and center. Um, to breathe or to uh, uh, walk and be in line with gravity, right? Mm -hmm. We don't need that. So uh, this this style of practice and study is we we want to first make sure you really get the basics, the Buddha nature basics, you know that nature mind and the powers and the realizations and the compassion, which is the same as saying, we really want to get, you know, for you to understand uh, like that there's gravity and time and things like that. So I'm trying to point to these universal qualities that um, aren't owned or particularly regulated by personal self that the personal self actually has to go along with, right? So we have to go along with gravity and time, right? Is that so, correct? Mm -hmm. So uh, I, I meet with many people a day and some people I meet with believe in the time stretch machine. <laughs> so they believe that if they leave their house late and they wish and wish and wish and try to compact time that they will get uh, to the middle way office or darshan uh, in a shorter period of time because they believe in the time stretch machine. Okay? So uh, in the relative sense, there is no time stretch machine. So uh, they may be thinking, I deserve to um, get more done before I leave the house or I deserve to get there quicker. You know, so that's an ego thing, right? I deserve this. But behind that is a belief in that there's a time stretch machine, a magical thinking that somehow the lights will alter green or that you'll kind of sail over, you know, the cars or something. But there's no time stretch machine in the relative world. So uh, uh, when we're using these uh, terms of, uh, Clear light mind or dharmata or uh, you know any of the mahamudra and any of the Buddha nature terms, uh, these sound like qualities that are developed uh, as a result of uh, a personal development. 
but they're they're elemental energies and uh, uh, aliveness. So the the standpoint of uh, the shastra and this level of teaching is that, of course, um, the whole universe is alive. So and we can't have a standard kind of like Buddha nature's somehow in my brain, and then there's uh, you know kind of matter out there that is there's nothing like that in 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 this. So uh, you would have to say, well, gravity is everywhere, and the Buddha nature qualities are are everywhere, and then the personal self uh, becomes aligned with these truths. So I've gone a little over, so I want to uh, thank people for their attention uh, uh, and patience, uh, because I know not everybody has read the text. Uh, it makes sense if you struggle through the text uh, after you've sung it or, or read through it. So I know uh, Dirk is very busy, and I appreciate everything he does. Um, uh, and maybe we can find a time, maybe it could be read over a week, if not one day, so that we could, you know, but it would be wonderful to read it out loud and then people would get the true sense of it, right? Like that. Maybe, maybe we could do it a week from Saturday in the evening? Something like that would be wonderful, yeah. Okay, okay. Yeah. So um, these are uh, texts are. Uh, transcendental, just like the Prajnaparamita text. So once we've left the first turning of the wheel and we're into the second turning of the wheel, the Prajnaparamita text and the Mahayana, and then now the mind only uh, style of teachings, the third turning of the wheel, uh, we, we are not in what we normally think of as ordinary reality or normal. Normal or ordinary reality is the world of separateness and belief in absolute uh, uh, objects. So we've, we've left that behind. So I think those people that are, um, uh, I find that many times those people that are into science fiction actually make uh, good Dharma practitioners, you know? So like that. So uh, I don't know what particularly you should read, but uh, uh, science fiction that talks about space and time and strange things can be helpful for your Dharma practice. <laughs> yeah, okay. I just outed myself, okay. <laughs> All right, let's do a dedication. Yeah. Due to the merits of these virtuous actions, may I quickly attain the state of a Guru Buddha and lead all living beings without exception into that enlightened state. May the supreme jewel bodhicitta that has not arisen arise and grow, and may that which has arisen not diminish, but increase more and more. In the land encircled by snow mountains, you are the source of all happiness and good, all powerful chin raising, Tenzin Jato. Please remain until samsara ends. May the teachings of the Buddha flourish, and may the upholders of the teachings remain forever. May all migrators achieve happiness, and may they fulfill all their temporary and ultimate goals. Bosan, magical display of the deep awareness of all the victorious ones, merciful giver of a stream of profound and vast instructions to the fortunate migrators, please remain always unperishing, unchanging, unfading. Avalokiteshvara, great treasure of objectless compassion. Manjushri, master of flawless wisdom. Vajrapani, destroyer of the entire host of Maras. Tsongkhapa, crown jewel of the snowy land sages. Losangaragpa, I make request at your holy feet. Um, thank you for doing um, Manjushri practice. Uh, uh, whether we call it um, prajna or jhana, um, primordial mind or awareness, uh, this capacity to wake up is central to our tradition. So um, 
you know, thank you for doing that central practice and uh, may you all be healthy until we meet again in video land or here in person, okay? Ciao. Bye -bye. Thank, you. thank you, Lama. Thank you, Lama. Yeah, yeah thank thanks, Lama. Great. Yeah, thank, thank you. you. <laughs> thank you so much. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. Thanks, James. Ciao. Thank Mille grazie.